Hello Tank fans, welcome back to Totally Tank. My name is John. Our regular uh, co-host Andrew has uh, had to make other life choices than sitting in a pod talking about tanks, but I'm fortunate to be joined by... Rob, hello. Hello, and Rob has played thousands of hours of World of Tanks. I don't know about thousands, but quite a few. <laughs> and some of them I even remember. Okay. And with that, that professional qualification, um, we will um, move on. Rob, what tank are we talking about today? We're talking about the Ontos. Yes. Now, when I said to you we were going to talk about the Ontos, you said, what the hell is an Ontos? Correct. <laughs> but when I mentioned it to Pete last night, he remembered it. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. While you were playing World of Tanks. While we were playing World of Tanks, yes. Right. So, it's a, um, a short uh, amphibious... Well, that's, is it amphib- that's not an amphibious. It's a light tank. It's a light tank. Well, it's a tank destroyer, in fact. Is it? It is a tank destroyer, yes. Did it ever destroy a tank? It did. Oh, okay. In the Santa... De, uh, the Puerto Rican... No, not the Puerto Rican. Who's the Santa Panama. Dominican? No, Santa, Santa Domingo. Okay. The one next to Haiti. Granada? No. Okay. No. Okay. Let's let's keep rolling with the Ontos. Yes. So it is a small, light um, tank with a somewhat unusual main armament. Six recoilless rifles strapped onto the outside. Now, this is something it's had... You wouldn't see it anywhere else. No, and, well, you would, and that's where we get to cultural impact, because this has spawned a whole genre of drawings, designs, video games, movies, TV shows of the mecha, the armed That's mecha. right. The um, the quintessential Robotech uh, monster, the walking m- uh, mech that comes out with, a great, uh, with six great big barrels hanging off the back of it, or the... Uh, Battletech Rifleman with uh, a bunch of rifles sticking out the side of that. Uh, it all reminiscent of the Ontos with the six recoilless rifles just strapped on the outside and saying, yep, I'm going to shoot lots of stuff at you because why bother having one barrel when you can have six? I'd also say, I mean, Warhammer 40,000, uh, or 40 caters to its friends, uh, an enormous number of the models um, have got this multi-barreled armature that... The Ontos, they weren't actually arms, they just looked like arms. Yes. And the other thing that I always wondered looking at those Battletech robots with all those guns sticking out the sides was how do they reload those? And with the Ontos, you find out the answer. That's right. You find out the loader climbs out the back of a tank, (laughs) walks around to the back of each of the six uh, recoilless rifles, opens up the chamber, ejects the round, puts a new uh, 18 kilo uh, round into it, closes the chamber up again, does that six times and then climbs back into the tank and says, we're ready to fire again. Yeah, which in certain circumstances, getting out of the tank to reload it would not be a let's beloved fa- job. Let's face it, this is uh, this is a bully of a tank. It, it <laughs> does not go into battles uh, and expects to be there uh, on, its own, on its own survivability. It had half an inch of armour mm. uh, on the front and a uh, quarter inch on the base, so it was uh, vulnerable to landmines. It could be taken out by pretty much anything that uh, looked harshly at it that uh, had, was more than uh, more than a fifty cal. Um, so it was, it was not... basically just enough armor to trigger a heat round, wasn't it? Yes, and it was. Uh, you didn't want to be in it if you were taking, unless you were ambushing other tanks. You don't want to be taking on anything anything armored that has more of a punch. Well, so any sort of a punch. Sure, and its main use was the U.S. Marine Corps ordered it. Well, the U.S. Army ordered it. Oh, okay. They asked for a thousand. It was uh, the prototypes were a thousand of these crazy things. Yep. The U.S. Army ordered a thousand. Uh, It was being built in a tractor factory in Indiana. Um, They had a look at it and said, "Yeah, no, we don't want that anymore." We just can't find anyone who's willing to load it. No. And then the Marines said, "Oh, yeah, all right, we'll uh, do something with it." And they took eventually took uh, almost three hundred of the vehicles um, and deployed them around and. Problem was they didn't know what to do with them. Nobody had came up come up with any sort of doctrine for them. They said, "Yes, it's a tank destroyer. Go out there and blow up tanks." Well, we're not fighting tanks, so when they we weren't fighting them, and uh, as I said, there was a coup attempt in Santo Domingo. Yeah, right. Um, oh, Dominican Republic. That's where it was. There Sorry, Dominican Republic. That's what I'm thinking of. Santo mm-hmm. Domingo being the capital, I think it is. Um, Saint Dominic's very popular in that part of the world, isn't he? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they. They didn't have any sort of doctrine, so they weren't expecting. They weren't fighting tanks, uh, and even not even in Vietnam. Uh, so it's a question of, well, what do we do with a tank destroyer when we don't have any tanks? Thoughts? Well, 
that does come down to operational use, which we will get to in the next segment. <laughs> okay, so let's talk technical specs. Ontos, the name of it actually means thing in Greek. Yep. So that it's it's not getting a lot of respect. The, drug, the, right from the, the crew back. also called it uh, the pig. The pig. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, a friend of mine who was in the U.S. Army um, chose to jump out of planes because he just didn't want to get stuck in tanks. There you go. And um, I imagine this was. It's air portable, so you can throw it out. Well, whether or not you can throw it out of a plane, it is air portable. Uh, so that was one of the big selling points for the Marines is that um, the cargo planes of the 50s and 60s could pick one of these up and um, fly it around anywhere where you couldn't with a uh, main battle tank. True. And it was only um, 8,600 kilos, so yep. eight and a half tons, which is 12, 12 very foot, light in tank world. 12 foot long, eight, uh, almost nine foot wide. So you can go a lot of places that other tanks couldn't. It was Good for uh, soft ground and uh, with the rice paddies of um, Vietnam, it could um, traverse those, whereas other tanks would get, uh, heavier tanks would get bogged and couldn't go through them. So it would basically go anywhere an infantryman could go. And that became one of the um, aspects of it. So one of the things with the recoilless rifles. Now they were actually, they were called 106s, mm -hmm. which, uh, but they were actually 105 uh, mil round, um, uh, caliber. Okay. Uh, caliber round. Um, uh, it's around the caliber is the length of yes, the barrel in the go. widths. But yes. yes. But um, they didn't want to get getting confused with the other 105 recoilless rifles around. So they called call it 106. They called it the 106. <laughs> That's a very admirable because solution. Because <laughs> supposedly there was something slightly different about its rounds to theirs. So, yep. they, so um, when, when somebody's... When, you, when you're looking at logistic systems and you're saying... Well, we've got some 105 rounds over here. We've got some 105 rounds over there. I'm sure they're interchangeable, and they're not. The first time someone blows their fingers off, mm. uh, changes well, get made. Yeah, yeah blow, blows the <laughs> tank up and uh, <laughs> kills all her 15 people around it. That's yeah, not a good thing. Yeah. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about recoilless rifles. They were a concept that became very popular in the 1950s and almost completely died out on the battlefield uh, by the 1990s and are now making a weird comeback. But basically what we're talking about is a system where you use twice as much propellant as you would otherwise need to fire the shell from a normal ca cannon, mm -hmm. and you blast so much out of it at the back that it balances the force going out the front, and you can have a much lighter mounting than you'd otherwise need for a cannon firing an equivalent shell at an equivalent velocity. Yeah. If you ever see a tank or a um, uh, artillery piece firing, you'll see, when it actually fires, the barrel itself will retract back as the round goes out. And that's the um, basically it, taking the shock of the propellant going out. Mm. Whereas a recoilless rifle just stays there as a tube and with a burny bit going out the back, pointy, uh, a hard bit going out the front, and away you go. So you spend a lot more accelerant out the back mm. uh, of the thing. So you don't want to be standing behind these things. When very dangerous off. to be behind. Also very expensive when you start planning massive tank battle in full to gap. Um, when you're having to use twice as... Because propellant is not free. Mm. Um, when you're having to use twice as much for every equivalent round. Even the Americans got to the point where they were like, this is too expensive. We'll just use proper cannon. But the thing is... Um, you don't then have to, uh, as long as you've got nothing behind you, you don't have to uh, have a great big turret or a great big um, system um, around, uh, chassis around the cannon to, uh, the artillery piece to take that shock. Yeah. Because you can just whack it on the back of something like a technical mm. and away you go. Yeah. Or, and, and the comeback that I spoke of with recordless rifles is that the Carl Gustav um, weapons system. Um, which is basically a very small man portable recoilless rifle, but it's still what an eighty five millimeter round. Eighty four, uh, and it's quite so. heavy. And but I have fired a couple of them. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and for a man portable weapon, that they've. I'm, ba I'm, glad, I'm glad I wasn't the person carrying the body thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it might be man portable, but it's not man fun. <laughs> I was actually watching a doco on um, Charlie G's just last night. And one of the things that struck me was the rounds are so enormous. I was thinking, okay, it's, it's all very well and good to say you've got a guy carrying one. How, how many dudes need to be also doing nothing but carrying the ammunition to actually lug a, um, a workable um, payload? Well, that's your uh, direct fire weapons support team of the uh, heavy weapons company of, <laughs> yeah. your, of your uh, infantry uh, battalion. And away you go. So those are the guys who like having people driving them around because... Uh, Yep, that's not a fun thing to do. 
Okay, moving on with back to the Ontos though. So it was made by Alice Chalmers, mostly known for their tractor manufacturing, and and this was an attempt of theirs to get into weapons. And they mustn't have enjoyed the experience very much because they didn't ever really return to it. No, that is, they had to work weekends and close the uh, plant down and only have special people in there. So uh, it would have been a sh- pretty uh, annoying job to do, saying, yep, I've got to come into, uh, come into work on the weekends, but I can't tell you what about. And yeah, they were really hoping they were going to get that thousand uh, order. Um, that would have made it worthwhile, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Instead, they got stuck yeah, having to do it with their existing... Ugh, would have been a nightmare. Um, okay, now, it was a petrol engine. Yep, most tanks were back then. Um, mm. It was just more compatible, and they hadn't figured out uh, how to transfer, get their heavy diesels to um, provide the push that they needed and the speeds they wanted. Yeah, although this only reached the lofty heights of 30 miles an hour. But that's <laughs> a lot faster than a lot of tanks at the time. Your MBTs, uh, your main battle tanks at the time, uh, weren't going weren't going fast, whereas this could uh, do that over um, pretty much a lot of terrains. But as the Marines found in Vietnam, it was much better as a um, um, infantry support vehicle. It, yeah, and in terms of doctrine, it, it's quite weird because normally what doctrinally is considered an infantry tank, hmm. yes, it's slow, but it's very heavily armoured. This wasn't very heavily armoured. Um, infantry tanks normally don't actually carry an enormous main armament, and this thing was nothing but main armament. Well, it, it wasn't leading the way with the uh, no. with the, with the marines. It was no, it you, wasn't you, you let your infantry go out. Uh, you let your marines go out the front, contact the enemy, and then when they found a point where they needed to employ this weapon, mm. like clearing jungle, it was very good for that because yeah. they could fire... Six beehive rounds. Six yeah. beehive <laughs> rounds. They reckon they could uh, clear out to 250 metres, quarter quarter mile. No, mm. that's quarter four, four... No, that was, sorry, quarter of a mile, they said, so yeah. 400 metres. Yeah, right. Uh, they could clear a patch of jungle out for 400 metres, which denying the enemy uh, the cover that they and concealment that they're relying on mm. is a very important part of um, the situation. Plus, when the whole jungle around you disappears, and you're probably taking some significant um, light wounds from mm, um, the shrapnel. jungle disappearing around you. Yeah. Um, and the trees it, blowing up. It would be quite an um, alarming event. And 400 metres, it's one of those things, everyone talks about um, metres in Miltech stuff, as if, you know, oh, this has got a range of 10 kilometres. But In I've, jungle warfare, 400 <laughs> metres is a long way. In any sort of warfare, 400 metres is the edge of which the range which with an unaided eye you can discern objects mm. um you know on the, the the street just up the road from here there's a kilometer right it's basically a kilometer from here down to northbourne avenue which means nothing to anyone i've who seen your bike ride video yeah um but the point is stand at one end look down the other end you can maybe make out a car um but a person who doesn't particularly want to be seen you're not going to see mm. um and, and even a vehicle, um, you're going to struggle if they're all the same colour and military vehicles are all green. So, <laughs> But it can also be useful for clearing the terrain so that when you're calling in your artillery or airstrikes, you can actually mm. see where they're landing so rather than saying, oh, I think you need to go a little bit deeper. Yeah. Uh, but, well, that is a very good point as well. Yeah. Um, although having fired your six rounds, that then the unfortunate. Well, you, you have the, to uh, no, you re- mm-hmm. retreat back, retreat, yeah, you retreat back out. behind your uh, marine um, uh, escort, and then the loader gets out and starts the arduous job of reloading. Mm. Now, one of my questions for this tank was whether or not it actually had a tank phone. So. We talked, you talked about it in one of your other episodes, the tank yes. phone, and how it was such a good invention to be able, for the infantry to be able to walk up to the back of the tank, pick up the phone and say, hello, we'd like a round of uh, HE mm. uh, over there, please. Yeah. Or you're about to roll over, mm. Jim, can you not do that? And, yep. Um, lo- lots of little simple communications thing that a buttoned now, up tank you can't do. From what I could see, it didn't appear to have one, but what it does have is a uh, hatch doors at the back. So I was going to say the back door was normally open on. So you could actually just open the door and talk to them from there. So, yeah. but it is it is a worthwhile consideration when you're working closely with with infantry. Mm. Now, one of the other things that uh, we we're talking about before with the Marines, let's face it, if if this had been used by the U.S. Army in Vietnam, they probably wouldn't have known what to do with it. Whereas the Marines, the whole point of what they do is they adapt they, uh, and overcome. With no doctrine, no idea how to use this thing, it was up, left up to the commanders on the ground to say, okay, I've got six recoilless rifles on a mobile chassis that can go pretty much anywhere my Marines can go. I imagine a lot of I'm just going to take it with me and yeah. see what I can do with it. I because imagine a lot of heavy equipment um, might have been sort of 
strapped to the back of it as well. It's, yeah, uh, well, it's camping people, gear. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the point being is that because there was no doctrine, the Marines had to adapt and, uh, and, and figure out what to do with this thing and saying, well, we've got it. We're going to use it. Mm. Uh, whereas... For the army, they would have said, right, we've got to keep them in um, in uh, platoon lots of three vehicles mm. and we're going to only deploy them at battalion level, da, 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 da. whereas Marines said, yeah, we'll send one out with the company. That yep. was it. And that was the company support vehicle. So that's a really good use of penny packeting your uh, firepower because you know the enemy isn't going to have tanks themselves. Now, tanks themselves, uh, it did kill... The Ontos is uh, reported to have killed two tanks in the Dominican Republic during that coup in 64. Um, yeah, right. So it does have some uh, tank kills up uh, to its name. I mean, 105 recoilless, which tends to be a lower mu- muzzle velocity, is getting anemic for tank warfare by the 60s. Now, I would guess the tanks in the Dominican Republic... They were light French tanks. Yeah. <laughs> AMX 13 something rather. Yeah, sure, so... So not tra- not taking on um, T sixty fours or anything um, really unpleasant. No. But, uh, yeah, but that does also highlight the point that most almost all tank warfare is actually tanks blowing up lighter vehicles than than tanks. Mm. Um, um, the other one was there was no dedicated um, crew training pathway. So with which, usually with your uh, with your uh, U.S. Army, they'll say, right, you're um, you're a tank man, and you go off and do lots of tank training courses. Well, for the Marines, it's a case of, uh, we've got this tank-like thing. Uh, have you driven a tank before? Yep. Have you loaded uh, a recoilless rifle before? Yep. Have you done com- uh, commander's role before? Yep. Okay, you're done. Get in there, get in there, and away you go. So there's no dedicated career stream pathway doctrine leadership or anything around this it was really so it really was the marines were the only ones who could probably use it with the idea of you've got nothing we're not going to give you anything but still you need to get it done which yeah plays into this whole point of how counter doctrinal the tank was the the idea of operating tanks isolated uh and alone versus the um you know, not Klauswitzian, but I guess um, Guderian uh, model of um, concentrated armoured spear points and, um, and the rest, which is no use at all in a counterinsurgency in the Vietnamese jungle. No, no. <laughs> well, there is no front line to, uh, to crash through and uh, exploit the, uh, uh, the, the rear areas. There is, yeah, you really can't do it. Yeah. What, 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 Sorry, your rear areas were Cambodia, which we weren't really allowed yeah, to go. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's not go there today. <laughs> I think it was, but That's the, a different the, podcast. I don't know which one it is. <laughs> the Antos had been retired by it was retired in sixty nine before uh, Nixon gave the uh, authorization to go through Cambodia. <laughs> yes, um, which is we've sort of merged in with service history, but that's okay because um, being a unusual vehicle, we're going to do this podcast in a slightly unusual way. Um, I would also say there is a misunderstanding which I had until quite recently that coaxial machine guns on proper tank turrets. Uh, were used for ranging the main gun. No, you've usually got a dedicated spotting rifle, a 50 cal, yes. uh, that'll be lined up right beso- in line with the on top of the barrel or right beside the barrel yep. of whatever weapon you're firing. Now, the Ontos itself had four. Yes. Uh, so I don't know what they did for the other two. Just hope they uh, well, maintained once alignment. The, once they'd sighted with well, the, thing is, the, if the, if, the whole point is if it's if if the barrels themselves of the recoilless rifles aren't in alignment with each other. So if they're mm. not all four, six pointing in the same direction, mm. uh, millimeters can tell be making uh, differences over twelve hundred meters. True. Or I would like I would like to think that. Um, well, when aligning you, the when on you top s- barrels was a priority. Yeah, when a- you see the guys sitting on top of the barrels as they're uh, driving along, you say, well, that's going to throw out your alignment uh, when the uh, mm. with the weight of a person sitting there doesn't tell you much unless those... Because um, they're just bolted on. It's not... Uh, so they can... Yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated assembly the more you look at it. Um, mm. And for such a little vehicle, it really does dominate the whole vehicle. The um... But it also did have a 30 cal coax uh, machine gun for the commander. Yes. Uh, for close in fire support, as a, or for uh, fire, pro- <laughs> uh, fire protection, or whatever you want to say. Or the uh, reverse the tank now, 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 <laughs> now, 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 now. now. <laughs> uh, it, it should be noted that on at least one documented occasion, the um, tank commander of an Antos removed his um, own seat from the vehicle to uh, fit a box of shells, um, which he then sat on. 
<laughs> because they only carried 18 shells, so yeah. six six loaded. Mm. And for the first two years of the Vietnam War, I don't think mm. they are actually allowed to go in loaded. They had to travel with the Marines. Right. If contact happened, then, then, then they, get out. That's a bad idea. I know. That's a terrible uh, idea. Eventually... <laughs> It's suspected while that doctrine, uh, while the rules of, of engagement uh, weren't changed for, I think it was about two years after they were deployed, it's felt that uh, there are a lot of people on the ground didn't apply that rule straight away because that would have been a really bad way of uh, using this vehicle. So Particularly, it's quite noisy, and you, you'd think the Vietnamese would hear it coming and be planning unpleasant things involving RPG-7. Well, you have Marines wandering around as well. They're probably noisy as well. Well, uh, not as noisy as an on <laughs> But the point being is that um, it only carried 18 rounds in the, uh, in the tank itself, mm. plus six in the chamber. So 24 mm. rounds. But think about it, 18 rounds, that's reloading four times for this thing. If you were needing to reload... That's a busy day at the office. Yeah, if you were needing to re- reload all six barrels more than four times, you're, um, you're in a real bit of a fight. Yeah, although this was heavily involved in the Tet Offensive, um, so I imagine um, that was a um, big day at the office. Yeah, clearing Hue and uh, in the Battle of Khe mm. uh, both of those, they were employed in both locations. Um yeah, well, Kaysan, there was no going home, and it wasn't very far back to the base either, was no, it? No, so they would um, uh, roll them out at night time. They didn't want to uh, expose them during the daytime when the um, uh, North Vietnamese Army could call in artillery, um, spot them and call in artillery accurately. But yeah, at night time, right. they would roll them out to the perimeter yeah. and use them effectively there because uh, they couldn't, uh, the NVA could not call in artillery as accurately at night. Yeah, right. I didn't know that. Okay. That's, um, you don't see. In popular depictions of Kaysan, you don't see enormous mech warrior tanks rampaging. They're not around. enormous though; they were very small. They'd, they'd be bunkers <laughs> way bigger than them, and yeah, they, yeah. they they like hiding behind a berm yeah. because they have no armor. <laughs> yeah, and the um and you've got a very high turret on it. So mm. with these great big six um, recoilless rifles, you just you want to berm in front of it, mm. protecting the actual hull, and uh, and just only the turret sticking up. Now the turret itself was um, only had limited. Uh, 90 degree um, turning at the front so it was only front towards enemy type activity it's no no none of this um, spin around and shoot things behind you was a case of uh, turn, shoot something behind me okay I've got to uh, reverse back and do a three point turn and then yeah, finally I'm going to shoot is, something this is not a vehicle designed for the enemy being behind you no <laughs> no it is uh, it is a bully of a battlefield tank and only wanting to take on infantry yeah, and also apparently the um, many of the turrets were removed when the um, parts started to run out for it. Yes, because it was all by itself. There was no other tanks like it. Um, they there was no logistics uh, supply chain for it. Uh, no maintenance um, schedule, and it was a case of right. This one's busted. Get all the bits off it that aren't uh, that are still working, and stockpile them for when another one breaks. And so cannibalizing one to to fix another. Yeah, that the um, when that happened, apparently what happened was that the turrets were then removed from the vehicles and they were used as um, static defense towers, mm-hmm. which is very um, it feels like a tower defense game to have. Yeah. <laughs> pew pew pew. Um, Track, tracks was one of the main things. So whereas a lot of the other parts were interchangeable with things, um, mm. the tracks because of the you needed an Alice Chalmers tractor, did you? That's pretty much, a, you needed yeah. the the tank tracks themselves and the torsion bars that went with them. It were the only things that they couldn't get. So that's um, probably one of the reasons why they said, "No, let's take the turret off and now we'll use it statically." Because once your uh, tracks are gone, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to do you much good. Okay then. Now, we just want to talk quickly about some recent innovations in the, um, the wonderful um, world of tanks. The, uh, the Russians have been um, publishing some results from their um, efforts using autonomous tanks in the Syrian conflict. And um, basically what they've figured out is you have to be really, really close to your autonomous vehicle. And this raises a few questions uh, that I have, because I was w- watching just this morning on the news, um, a weapons company was trying to sell the, um, their autonomous vehicles program, and basically they need a big tent um, full of nerds um, to control the tank. 
And one thing I know about tents is um, when you feel the need to move, it takes quite a while to, to, <laughs> to pack them up. And I mean, just all the, the little tables, you know, they've got to be packed up and they've got to put on something. And um, if you can only, if, you know, as we said, 400 metres can feel like a long distance on a battlefield, but um, it's quite close to the front line for a, you know. Unless, unless you've got a nice big hill between you, and in which case your uh, comms are probably aren't as good. Well, yeah, like your comms either. are stuffed anyway, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, we, we all like to, you know, the best place for playing war games is on a tabletop. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> in reality, you don't get too many tabletops. And sure, we all wish we were fighting tank battles and full the gap. But, you know, full the gap never happens. And, <laughs> um, and you're stuck in the real world where it, apparently if you need to be within 400 metres. It just struck me watching this that um, at, at that point where you can't be that far away from the vehicle and with the, you know, fortunes of war, that can be extremely dangerous. And... If your nerds all have to have little desks and little machines to plug their Xbox controllers into, it seems easy to just put them in the vehicle. Well, the other option is you, um, rather than a wireless solution, you go back to a, a wired solution and you just have the uh, a wire trailing out of your back out of the back of your autonomous vehicle and straight back to yeah, that can, your comms can go a lot further. Uh, you just got to make sure that nobody cuts that wire on you, and then you're stuff. Otherwise, you're stuff. But say that's a bit of a vulnerability. <laughs> it is, a vulnerability. but but it is an effective way of doing. I mean, even even at the moment, where um, there are still plenty of wire guided missiles are used in in the world for busting tanks. That is very true. You but... fire it off, and you drive, you joystick that tank, yeah. that missile straight into the side of your tank. I would say a, a wire guided missile is only expected to maintain that communications link for a matter of seconds, though. Yes, because <laughs> once when, when, once the missiles reach its target, the the, the wires mission is mm. has come to an end. It's, um, does anyone ever get injured by the wires? Because those things must be really unspooling at a well when they're firing them out at Woomera. Um, I think it's pretty pretty empty out there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking you know urban environments, but uh... <laughs> speaking of urban environments, mm. that's one of the good uses for the Ontos. Oh, okay, we're back to the Ontos. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. So it was. Found that where in the Huey uh, offence, uh, when they were going, when the Marines were going through Huey mm -hmm. in Vietnam, um, they could. They, it was very hard. It was very. The Ontos was very good at taking out buildings. So yes. as the Tet Offensive a, a moved large, forward, slow round um... and direct fired from the ground mm. versus artillery or airstrikes it's on a populate or from yeah. a pop in a populated environment. Mm. You don't really want to be artillery. Um, Calling an arty on your um, on a what supposedly is a civilian population who is you are trying to protect. True, a, a grid square in an urban environment does become a problematic target. It does. Yeah. Whereas uh, one of these things, as soon as they identified the where the um, uh, NVA and the Viet Cong had taken a particular building within the town, mm. uh, they would call up the Ontos and said, "Yep." put two rounds of recoilless into that building and it would clear them out and then the Marines could go charging in and make sure uh, it, was all, it was all done and dusted. Sure, so, as an anti-sniper weapon, yeah, this would actually be quite useful. And because it was so small and could get through small streets, let's mm. face it, Vietnam was not, uh, the towns of Vietnam were probably not known for having nice wide autobahn avenues for no, about, driving about, tanks down. About the width of an ox cart is the um, Pretty standard, much, so yeah. whereas you can get uh, this on the Ontos, it is about that wide, or a little bit more, but you can get where mm. you need it to go. It's about two ox carts wide, so if the street <laughs> can take an ox cart either way, then there you go. there's your Ontos. Yep. And because the barrels are reasonably short, you don't mm. have the problem of trying to manoeuvre the barrel around corners. Yep, which um, buildings wise, Germans discovered was a pretty big problem with their tigers and um, panthers. All yeah. the uh, front facing, all the uh, front loaded uh, barrels that they want to be able to traverse around. Okay, I, I hadn't actually considered that, and uh, certainly the Russians in their Chechen wars found that um, anti aircraft mounts were really useful because um, they were mostly up upward facing, and while not quite what an Ontos does, um, thirty millimeter high explosive. Um, into a building window will um, quieten the residents down. Um. <laughs> yes, yes, it will. Yeah, it had a um, ten degree uh, depression um, angle and mm. twenty degree ang angle of elevation, so it had a fairly good range. So we'd go to the top of a hill, look over the stick, it, stick the uh, turret. Uh, so stick the um, lean over the top of the hill and still fire down, which is a really good thing to have on a tank. That is uh, for any sort of hill fighting tank. Your angle of depression is on your barrel is really important because 
it makes it so much harder for any uh, anybody else to hit you. Yeah. Um, other things with it. Okay. They didn't bring many back. They l- most of them got scrapped. So whereas you'll be able to find um, all sorts of tanks from World War One and so forth still around in collections today, um, the Ontos itself didn't. Uh, they mostly got scrapped. So they're very few available for in museums or tank uh, or um, uh, kept as any sort of uh, exhibition. Mm-hmm. So there's... There is a list of tank uh, homes in... Um, yeah, Wikipedia's in, got a preserved vehicles on display list. Yeah, yeah, some of the... Um, uh, the imp- oh, sorry, armoured battalions in um, in America and the Marine School of Armour or something like that uh, got one or two. But the other one when they were used is they were used as... Um, the turrets were taken off and they were given to the forestry service, so as uh, mobile vehicles for um, okay. working remote forest areas. I reckon that'd be miserable. <laughs> I want well, to note, at least you didn't have to reload it. I want to note that this map on Wikipedia, or this list of Wikipedia, says the American Military Museum in El Monte, California, has an M50, that's the Ontos, that is missing its six recoilless rifles. Yeah. And I would say, that's a dud. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't have the rifles on it, uh, I mean, geez, come on, American Military Museum, why wouldn't you just stick some uh, tree trunks on it and paint them black? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need working recoilless rifles. I just, I just want something that looks like it. Mm. Um, so, yes. as I said before, they retired in 69 um, after coming to service in 56, I think. Um, and what were they replaced with, John? Well, essentially, the Marines um, adopted the Carl Gustav as an infantry weapon and um, are still using it enthusiastically to this day. So... It's rollers um, carrying, you know, if you've got, I don't imagine they ever have eight squaddies with Carl Gustavs because someone has to carry the ammunition. But, you know, an M- um, a Bradley or um, one of the Marines um, infantry fighting vehicles full of um, dudes with um, Carl Gustavs is essentially filling the role that the Ontos used to fill. Now, for anybody who wants to talk about the Bradley, just go watch Pentagon Wars. That's a great movie. And it's so the Bradley has turned into a really good vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> But in 1964, when they were designing it, or whatever it was, yeah, that Pentagon Wars, guys, it's a great movie. Yes, the movie Pentagon Wars is for anyone with an interest in tanks. And um, how you build them. Yes, exactly. Um, in fact, it's it's homework for all listeners. Um, we are going to expect you to be across Pentagon Wars uh, by the time... Um, Carrie Always and Kelsey Graham? Kelsey Graham? Graham, yep. yeah. Kelsey Graham, yep. yeah. Um, Frazier. Frazier, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, Princess Bride. Wesley from Princess Bride. Princess Bride. Yeah. yeah. In tanks. In tanks. Yeah. Well, cooking sheep. <laughs> that's that's it for the spoilers. Uh, <laughs> okay, Rob, thank you very much for coming in and um, taking up the reins on Totally Tanked and adding your um, your valuable experience and expertise in uh, in tank land. Uh, and I've uh, driven I've driven an APC and sat in plenty. Okay, so there you go. All I didn't right. drive the APC very far. Though. That was that was an M one one three, wasn't? It? Yes. Okay, what's it like to drive? Uh, left stick, right stick, and away you go. Okay, I, I guess we're gonna have to do M one one three sometime soon. <laughs> awesome. That okay. would that would be a long podcast. Oh, will it? Okay. Yeah. You got the fifties technology that's still going today, buddy, and yeah. so many variations. It's weird because your service the... history for that would just go. Boing. Yeah, by the time you've stretched a vehicle and re-engined widened it. it and widened it, you've got to ask, is it still the same vehicle? But um, anywho, thanks folks for listening to this. Um, we do love your comments on Facebook, uh, so please leave more of those. And uh, we will endeavour not to um, put a six-month hiatus uh, before the next episode. Thank you. Goodbye.